All right. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. I know everyone online is is ready to go. So I'm just going to see if I can make meaningful eye contact with everybody in the room here. I don't like to interrupt discussions, but we are going to have a lot of discussion in this session. So um, I just wanted to say hi. Uh, my name is Dr. Ali Jacke. I'm the Director of Support for Learning here at UniSQ. And um, I've led student partnership work across several universities, and I always feel that I'm in the room with friends when I'm with the people who really care about partnership work. Before I go on, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, it's important to recognize that these have always been lands of learning and teaching um, long before our campuses were built. And I believe in a First Nations voice to parliament. And I think this is a time for listening and for, for empathy. And I'd like to thank Lucy for her beautiful keynote. And I, and Simon and I have talked about that we want to make sure that we we weave the the deep thinking um, um, that Lucy has encouraged us to do into um, this session as well. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Simon Varwell, um, who is joining us online from Scotland. Simon is senior development consultant with Sparks. Uh, Scotland's National Agency for Student Engagement, where he is the lead for institutional support and staff development. Now, I'm just double checking, we're going to get the Zoom room on the, the screen so everyone can see everyone who's online. We're doing a hybrid session. Oh, there we are. Uh, so, and I, I'm not going to lie, hybrid is is not the easiest way to work, but I don't mind a little bit of messiness. And I think Everyone in the room here today will, will come along on the ride with us. So um, to continue the introduction, because Simon really is the brains of this operation here today. Um, he's a graduate of University of Winchester's Master's in Student Engagement and is a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy and the author of various articles and chapters on models of partnership. And I'm sure Simon won't mind me saying that um, his article, his 2021 article on the visual models for exploring partnership is actually one of the most useful papers that I've ever read. I recommend it to people who are new to this space or those of us who've been working in the space for a while, but who want a new perspective. So Simon is going to set the scene for us today. And then we're going to get into some deeper discussion about our values, knowledges and activities that underpin our roles as practitioners. So I'm hoping that seamlessly I can say the words over to you, Simon, and he will be, we will hear him. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yes, I hope you can hear me in turn. Can you hear me? No, can anyone, are you hearing me? Online, we can hear you. That's good. Okay, are you hearing me in the room, Ali? You are? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so it's great to be with you all. It's great to be with you all. The theme of Quiet Voices is a um, a, a very appropriate one. Um, my nine-year-old daughter is asleep in the next room, so I've got to make sure that my voice is especially quiet, but I don't want it to be too quiet that I can't sort of actually hear you all as well. So do give me a shout um, verbally or in the chat box if it transpires that actually um, you, you, you can't hear me very well, but I'm just moving the chat box to be somewhere visible on my screen so that I can see that. So, um, yes, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed um, working with Ali, thinking through this session and getting an insight into some of the work that you've um, been building up to for this day. And um, I'll explain a little bit more about Sparks in a little moment, but um, we um, are effectively the SVA for Scotland. Um, and we've done a lot of work with SVA over the years with the various coordinators and hosts that there have been. And we've often um, a, joined events remotely and um, sometimes in person as well. We've had the privilege of 
of, of working with people in person and uh, indeed, indeed uh, met Lucy um, when she was over in, in Scotland on a on a research trip some time ago. So anyway, let me plunge in. So we're going to be talking about um, uh, uh, our professional standards framework for student engagement um, as a way of helping you as practitioners think about um, your role. Um, and for many of you, it might be worth, you know, th those of you access to the chat box, it might be worth bunging in your job title in the chat box. So just so I get a, a sense of who, what kind of roles are in the room, because um, not everyone, I think, in the world of student engagement has a job that is very easy to ex explain um, to people internally, let alone externally. Um, so, what I'd like to, you to think about is that question, what do you do for a living? How do you explain, as a practitioner of student engagement, um, what your job is, especially to someone who um, doesn't work in education? So imagine you're outside work, you're doing whatever you do in your in your, in your personal life. You might be, you know, um, in a, meeting a random stranger out walking the dog, or you might meet a random stranger um, um, in a pub or a coffee shop, or in the queue for the bus, or whatever else you do for fun. Um, and you get talking, and you're talking about the weather. Well, maybe that's just a British thing. I don't know if Aussies, Aussies and Kiwis also obsess about the weather constantly. Um, but whatever you, whatever you fancy talking about, tomorrow's vote, whatever it el whatever else it is. And then that question comes up: What do you do for a living? How do you answer that question? Because I absolutely hate it. I have a really weird job in an organisation that's hard to explain. So um, how do you explain, especially if you have student engagement um, in your role, how do you explain that to a lay person about whom you cannot assume they know anything about education? So again, if you have access to the chat box, bung that down. How would you explain in one sentence, one snappy sentence, what you do for a living? I sometimes wish I was a joiner or a nurse or a bus driver or one of these one of these jobs that passes the lift up flat books uh, test that you would give to a toddler, you know, a, a farmer, all these sorts of things. Um, so, um, yeah, good point, Benjamin. You've given up trying to explain to people what I do, even family. Yeah, some people think I'm a spy, and actually, I quite like that idea. But anyway, so have a wrestle with that and those of you in the room not in the chat box you know just discuss with your neighbor scribble it down on, on your note and show it to your neighbor how do you explain your job um, without um, going into too much detail and while you're doing that let me set the scene and tell you a little bit about sparks so um, our full name is student partnerships in quality scotland okay. sparks to our friends possibly our enemies as well but we don't seem to have too many of them thankfully because lots of people say nice things about what we do we are funded by our national strategic body the scottish funding council to basically do what our name suggests to build student partnerships and quality to um, build the learning experience around the views of staff and students working together. So we work um, across Scotland. We have a, a team of eight plus a, a larger team of student trainers. And we work with um, the, uh, oh, let me see now, about 40, 43 or 44 institutions, universities and colleges. So across higher education and further education. And um, we um, uh, work with all our national agencies. We do various bits of, of, of international consultancy work. And so sometimes if we struggle to explain ourselves, we'll use this slide. Daniela, I love what you say. I teach and I love it. What an absolutely great way of, that. you know, that should be a T-shirt, shouldn't it? Um, I engage students and I love it. I might get that commissioned. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's just a little bit about Sparks. We work very closely with, with, with Anna and Ali and um, many others across the SVA team. And just to give you a little bit more context about um, what we mean by student engagement and how we built it, 20 years ago, we put student engagement in our quality enhancement framework um, as one of the five key pillars um, in our university sector. You can see all of the different um, pillars here and student engagement is one of them. So you, it was based on the idea that you cannot create or shape or enhance quality without listening to the views of students and working in partnership with them. And so that has led to everything from um, you know, uh, close relationships between institutions and students associations through to students being on review panels and um, students playing a key role in, in the national level. 
And another thing that helps set the scene for, for, for what we do and what we are in Scotland is um, about uh, a decade ago, we created the Student Engagement Framework for Scotland, realising that the phrase student engagement meant, meant multiple things to, 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 to multiple people. Um, and so we decided to capitalise on that diversity of thought and bring it all together into this framework. And what you can see here in the circle is, is five um, things that you can engage students in. And right at the heart of it, it's students feeling part of a supportive institution and students engaging in their own learning. So that's the core kind of engagements. And wrapping around that are the three um, areas that um, underpin Sparks' work. So students sh shaping their learning, uh, the formal mechanisms for quality and governance, and then the national level decisions. So those are the five kind of areas in which we, we, we engage students. And then around that, we have the six features of student engagement. Um, uh, so whatever the engagement you do and wherever you do it and to whom you do it, hopefully these six features should be present. And obviously we're thinking an awful lot about um, responding to diversity today in terms of the topic of the um, uh, the. the, the quiet voices and what a hugely important time at least in Australia it is for thinking about quiet voices and who they are and how they can be best um, engaged in shaping the world around them. But the two that we've highlighted on this diagram are the focus on enhancement and change because if you know if you're engaging students and nothing's changing then what's the point of engaging them um, and the other one is students as partners this idea of shifting a power dynamic and it was great that Lucy was talking so powerfully about power earlier on in her keynote. And so really you need that big shift in power dynamic to truly make students partners. Um, and by the way, when you see these slides later on, um, the images throughout my presentation are, are links to the relevant documents. So you can, you can get these slides later and click them and they will take you to the relevant parts of the, um, uh, you know, our website or, or, or other parts of the Scottish sector. Thinking more practically about what this means for what we do, um, we um, develop student engagement, I suppose, in three ways. We, su we support the policies for student engagement. So institutions in Scotland will often have something like a, a strategy for student engagement or a student partnership agreement or something, something perhaps in, in other documents, for example, learning and teaching strategy, the institutional strategy that sets out what student engagement is and what you're aspiring to do with it and how you're going to build partnership between staff and students. Um, and of course, there'll be much else written in other documents, such as your quality enhancement plans, um, and um, th these will all be the effectively the policies and the, the, the papers that set out what student engagement is. And so a big part of our work is supporting these conversations about building these strategies. The second aspect is that of place. Um, and this is um, really about the kind of the elements of the bureaucracy or the decision making where partnership and engagement resides. So have a think about your organisation or your students association, your university, your college. Um, where is it that student partnership sits? Who is it or what's the body, the gathering of people? Um, that, that actually decides all of these things and decides what student engagement is. So typically in Scotland, you'll find there'll be some kind of shared committee, quite often co-chaired by a student lead and a staff lead, um, that will um, basically be a place for bringing together all the right people across the staff and student structures to um, uh, meet together and monitor and enhance and shape that partnership. Um, and for the purposes of, 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 of today's session, um, it's also important to think about the people. So, and a big a, a big aspect of our job is to shape the people who do student engagement. Um, and pr primarily uh, in Sparks, we work with our students association staff who might have a, a job title like something like you know engagement coordinator or representation coordinator, and the elected student officers who might be, for example, a vice president of education within the students union or students association, but there are also a whole host of other people who you might call student engagement practitioners um, in um, quality teams and student engagement teams, student experience teams right across the kind of the, the, the gamut of, of, of university services. And actually, um, if you want to think of student engagement not as a silo, but as something that everything cares, um, everything um, connects to, perhaps you can argue that all staff have an element of student engagement within their roles. We all, in, in our 
many different academic and non-academic roles support students and um, just like we all arguably have a responsibility for health and safety in our in our workplaces we all arguably have a responsibility for um for well-being or for equality and diversity so do we similarly all have responsibility for student engagement let me know in, in the chat box and give me your thoughts on that and as we've thought through um, how we support these student engagement practitioners, we've often thought about the difficulties, as, as I alluded to, and as you've, uh, some of you have alluded to in the chat box, about how to explain your job clearly and concisely. And um, we have developed, and this is our, our theme for, for, for this morning's session, a professional standards framework for student engagement. And what you can see here, um, and I'm just about to post a link to it in the chat box as well, um, what you can see here are basically three things. We have um, a, a set of values, we have a set of knowledge, and we have um, a set of activities. Um, and we used our student engagement staff network that we support in Sparks to um, describe what they thought were the values, knowledge and activities underpinning their jobs. And then we got a, a bunch of willing volunteers from that network to harmonize them into this framework that you see here and can see online. Um, and um, so the link is in the chat box. If you're not on the chat box uh, or if you're not in, in, in the Zoom link, um, go to the Sparks website and then look at the menu bar at the bottom of our, uh, of our website, sparks.ac.uk, sparks with a q.ac.uk. Go down to the bottom and there's a, there's a, there's a menu um, uh, or a site map at the bottom and you'll find our professional standards framework for student engagement. And so what this does is set out all these different values, knowledge and activities underpinning um, the, the work that student engagement practitioners does. Um, and, and, and perhaps it helps them answer that difficult question. They might have a bus stop as well um, or in the pub or whatever uh, about what they do. So that is a little bit about our framework. Um, and as you look at this, it might be worth thinking about, um, you know, how much of this you recognize and how much of this relates to your job. Um, but it's important, obviously, this is this document has come out of Scottish practice. So um, I'm handing back to Ali at this point to think, uh, to help us think through how this might kind of relate to Australian context. So um, those are just some initial thoughts for me. We'll get stuck into this framework in a little minute, but uh, over to you, Ali, for a second. Thanks so much, Simon. Um, that's wonderful. And um, everyone in the room here today um, has, I'm, I'm very, I've got a Gen X version of the online link. I just, I printed this out for everybody so that they could have a copy of it so that um, we can, we can look at these, these professional standards. And I think those of us in the room and online might be familiar with a framework like this um, from Advanced HE or the Higher Education Academy's professional standards. So online and in the room, could I just see your hands if you're aware of the, the HEA professional standards? You might be a fellow or an associate fellow um, or a principal fellow such as Simon. Um, so I think what's really interesting about that, um, and I'm, I'm keen to hear um, as we go into the discussion later from anyone in the New Zealand context um, that might have um, their own framework or knowledge of, of these frameworks. Um, I know in my process of applying for senior fellow, um, a lot of my fellowship did focus on student partnership and the ways in which I enact student engagement um, along the lines of their um, their values and, and knowledges. But this actually really creates a lens that allows us to drill much deeper into that work. So what I know from looking at all of you in the room and online and, and seeing where, where you all come from and where you work, and thank you to everybody. Oh, sorry, can I be louder? Sorry, um, sorry, Cynthia. Um, can, can everyone hear me okay online? Yeah, great, thanks, Lisa, I can see you. Um, so. I think one of the things that um, this um, adds to um, our, our specific roles, so some of our roles, we work in projects with students. I can see some of us lead this work. Some of us uh, um, have our entire jobs in the student partnership or student engagement space working hand in hand with students. And some do this in various different ways. So I think however you um, view your job, 
I think it's really useful for us to drill down into this part of our work today and to really think about how a framework like this helps us in our identities as practitioners and helps us to speak about the roles that we have. So I don't want to steal too much time um, with, with the talking. I would rather you guys get to speak um, in your groups and in the, in the group that Simon is going to facilitate online. So what we're going to do now is um, so that we can have the best conversations where we are in the places that we are, Simon is going to facilitate conversation online and I'm going to facilitate conversation in the room or group work in the room. And we'd like it to start with you looking at those, those values. And I'm just looking for Simon to nod to say, yep, yeah, this is what we agreed was going to happen. Yep. Yeah. Um, look at those values. So for one or two minutes, I want you to just quietly have a look at those and note down where you feel they align with your practice. And then we're going to separate the rooms. And in 10 minutes, we're going to come back together and share. Now, we've created a Miro board um, for the group work. So I'm going to post the link for that um, into the Zoom chat. And I'm going to facilitate that here. So in 10 minutes, so we're going to cut the rooms and then 10 minutes, we'll come back and we'll talk about the discussion that we've had. Is that okay, Simon? That sounds okay from your end? All right, let's do it. So what you can see on this slide, I've just got the suggestion that you might like to go over the standards framework with a pad and pen or whatever, using a tick to, to, to indicate what you think that you are working on. Uh, or do, it does uh, exemplify in your work um, a question mark for where you're not sure and an X for uh, where you're you're less sure or you don't think that you could demonstrate this. Um, and I'd like you to think about these these questions here once you get into the Miro board after you've done that reflection and um, chat with your chat with your 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 your, your colleagues on the table next to you and those of us in the chat box can be a group as well. Um, what what do you think might be the strengths or opportunities for development out of the, the commonalities that you have? Are you all ticking the same thing for, for the same indicators? Um, and um, what might that mean for you as an individual? What that might that mean for your organization or, or sectorally, nationally? <clears throat> so those of us in the chat box can uh, maybe um, take some time to think and then we'll, we'll have a natter um, shortly once you've done some mapping. Does anyone here in the in Zoom land want to kick off with any of their early reflections on this? Has anyone got any thoughts? I've just had a pop up to say that my sound quality isn't brilliant. Are people hearing me okay? I can see Mal and Kate on the screen. I've got a Kate thumbs up from Kate. Two thumbs up, so that that will do for me. Great, thank you. So yes, any early reflections on the framework and your mapping against it? Um, the floor is yours. Feel free to fire away in audio or I know there's a lot of us so maybe the chat box might be easier just um, let me know what you think 
hard to see where there isn't an opportunity for development, um, Kate. So, yeah, very good points. Yeah, so it's something of an inexact science, but I suppose if you were to if you were to demon if you were to be asked to demonstrate your 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 competence against one of the indicators, would it be easy to find some stuff to talk about? I suppose is another way of thinking about it. Um, yeah, and a uh, good point from Anya. We need to recognise um, and reward student engagement with things like scholarships. Yes, interestingly, we're now having some conversations in Scotland about how we might use this framework for student staff roles, not necessarily for student rep roles, but where students are getting involved in projects, um, for example, within student experience teams or quality teams. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the, uh, and using this framework to recognize what people have and what they can do um, is, is certainly very valuable, um, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah, if, if you could think of uses for this framework to help recognize where, where people are getting involved in things, then, then, then that would be great too. Yeah, any other thoughts? I can see the Miro board starting to get quite busy. Um, so people are posting things in their groups on the tables in, in, in the room um, in Springfield. Um, so I don't know if we think there's some common themes in there. If you want to post in your private thoughts, fire away. Um, but yeah, very happy to get more thoughts and reflections in the chat box here. Thank you, Anne. The university needs to also see students more as partners and lose the power imbalance view like lecturer and student. OK, so what does that mean for the, comp the professional attributes and competences of the person who might contribute to that, that shift in culture? Is this something for those in leadership roles? Is this something that student engagement coordinators and, and, and people at the grassroots and people working with students on a day to day basis can shift? And Lee, good point about physical spaces. Yes, absolutely. I mean, here we all are um, in an electronic space, but yeah, what do those physical spaces look like? I'm fascinated by the dynamics of rooms and where people sit and um, what it means for kind of who's important and who can be heard um, and, and who's spotted by chairs. You know, we often say to student reps, um, you know, sit next to the chair or sit opposite them so that they can, you know, when you're in a meeting, you can be you can be seen and heard. Um, and also there's a lot of interesting dynamics about how we use the physical space. For example, if you're meeting with students, are you bringing them into a classroom environment? If you're consulting with people, are you bringing them into a boardroom, which is a formal space? Um, and actually, if the students were to decide where the engagement happens, what does that look like? And what does that mean for the professional competences of the people who would help make that happen? Thank you, Lauren. Um, yeah, yeah, doing doing work is, 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 is one thing, can be hugely rewarding, but getting that back to the decision makers um, is another. So partly that's about the communication, partly that's about the skill that you would have as a practitioner to be able to tell those in positions of influence what's happening and what they might need to do. But I suppose then beyond that, there's a third step of um, actually turning that into action. So how do you, yeah, if, if you're not in a management position, how do you grab management by the, by the scruff of the neck and say, right, this is what the students are asking for. How are we going to do that? And students can sometimes get away with that more than staff can. And thank you, Kate. Yeah, it's so great meeting people who understand this work. When we get our student engagement staff network together, people enjoy the fact that they're in a room of people who understand what they do and they might spend the rest of their lives, even with their close colleagues, not being fully understood. So um, yeah, so, so your practitioner network in SVA is hugely important. And um, I, I, yeah, it'd be lovely to kind of learn more about what that achieves and what you're able to do with that space. Simon, this is Daniela. I just wanted to say a big thank you. It's just such a joy to listen to you and everything that I've read that you've done. It's, I'm from the University of Adelaide and um, 
we have a lot of amazing people who are really um, keen and interested in this space and care about our students. And it's just just to echo what everyone in here said, it's it's the framework that I think that um, we lack at the moment. And we're about to merge with another big university. So I see this as a huge opportunity to really start um, something amazing from scratch. And, and we refer to your resources constantly. And so I just wanted to say a big thank you. Um, and what a wonderful meeting it is today um, anyway. So you've just made my day. <laughs> oh, thank you, Danielle. That's very kind of you. And um, yeah, do let us know how you use our resources and what you make out of them. That's not my kind of paranoia or how dare you use our stuff. It's we're genuinely fascinated in what you what you what you make of it. So if you you know take our things and adapt them and do something fun with them, if there's impacts you can share, case studies you can develop, then then we'd love to know. Um, because sometimes when you put stuff out there online, you don't always know what happens to it. So if you're doing stuff with it, then thank you very much. And interestingly, you should Absolutely. mention Merck. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Actually, through SVA and I think through through Kate's work that I got that we got introduced to um, your institution. So currently we're just learning. <laughs> we haven't actually done mm. a lot of application, um, but mm. yes, we'll be uh, keeping you updated. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Do 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 drop me an email to to keep in touch. Um, and your point about merges is interesting. Um, about a decade ago, our further education colleges merged. Um, the grouped into regions, quite a lot of them merged with their neighbours. Um, so we moved from, I think, 44 colleges and we're down to 24 now. Um, and a couple, three of them merged just last month as well. So the, the journey is keeping going. And it re is really interesting. At that time, we had huge conversations about what this meant for the values of student engagement and what it meant for students' associations. Mergers are always traumatic times. I'm not going to be complacent about how, how difficult they are. But they did present an opportunity because you could have um, economies of scale in students' associations. And we had college students associations that finally had you know were big enough to employ a decent staff team and a decent officer team so there are some things that can come out there and it was it, we did a lot of work to support those conversations about well actually if you got this sort of smallish students association and this smallish one what can we do to get them together in a way that that, that, that develops something um a bit more coherent and sustainable oh thank um, you that's that's exactly what the conversations that we're having right now and we're hoping to because there is there is this amazing culture, as you say, in, in places, and we're hoping to bring that together and translate it throughout our process and um, and make this the focus across everything that we do and really demonstrate that to our students because mm -hmm. it's hard to get buy-in if students have been, you know, disappointed along the process and have invested energy yes. in it and haven't really seen the benefits across their time with us. So I'm, I'm yes. really keen for times to come. Yeah, I wonder if that uh, that kind of touches slightly on on Benjamin's point about um, the, the significant growth in apathy, and I think a lot of a lot of the apathy comes from people, um, um, I suppose, not seeing that their voice is having an effect. So we always do talk to people about how, as student engagement practitioners, you have a vital, vital work to close that feedback loop to communicate what's happened. Um, and that, that you know, can, can be a big part of understanding things. And it could be as simple as designing a survey where you say at the top, the last people who filled out the survey achieved A, B and C changes, um, or the last people who came to this focus group or attended this meeting made the following changes. Um, uh, and, and then that means you're more likely to take process seriously. Um, any work on... Uh, uh, Elisa, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Is there any work or, or research out there on governance and engagement? Um, yes, I can think of a few things out there. Um, I'll, I'll try and think of some names before the end. Uh, but yeah, if you look up some of the articles by Alex Bowles, B-O-L-S, um, who's, a, who's a practitioner in the sector in, in, in the UK, has written a couple of articles about student engagement and governance. Um, <coughs> uh, um, I'll Try and think of some other examples as well. Just looking at some of the more recent comments in the chat. Um, yeah, so Lisa, I think what you're doing is 
demonstrating there. I don't, I don't know exactly what your role is, but it looks like you're you're demonstrating some really good examples of of the the, the, the kind of the proficiencies and skills of a student engagement practitioner in terms of encouraging people and supporting people. That sounds like quite a sort of a soft kind of human kind of job. And then you're hosting meetings, so that's about making sure that the space works. So yeah, th these are the kind of things where I think you can demonstrate what you what you're doing um very effectively um oh liz um optimism i'm, I'm, all, I'm always in favor of optimism that's that's all good and um, historic resistance to change well partly i think you coming in as a, as a as a fresh pair of eyes and saying hang on a minute are we doing it like this this is terrible uh, it can be quite powerful and um, so actually people will trust a fresh perspective um and um and actually um it, it We've often, I don't know if there's been something in, 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 the, in the water in Scotland, but lots of student engagement coordinators have been changing jobs. We can, we can get loads of new people in and we um, have been using this framework and some other associated resources to get them thinking about their jobs and bringing them up, them up to speed. So I hope this is helpful for you as a, as, as a new person. So much historical resistance to change. Um, oh yeah, answers on a postcard. Fire away if you do have expertise on this, anyone else. Um, but I think it's it's sometimes it's about getting the institutional leaders to kind of um, get back to the floor and understand what's happening and listen to people. Um, I was there was a university in Scotland that had some industrial action, and I was speaking to one of the vice principals who had to do a nighttime shift as a security guard in halls of residences because all the whole the whole security guards were on strike, and he found it fascinating, you know, kind of um, de dealing with kind of drunk students at three in the morning and things like that. It's going to get some back to the floor, if you like. Um, okay, so let's just get back in one minute. Um, and if you want to go into the Miro board, um, remember we've got that there. You can post some thoughts. All right. Thanks, everyone. Oh, sorry, Simon. I feel like I just inter interrupted you because I can see you. <laughs> You're okay? No, no. Yeah, Ali, if you don't interrupt us, we'll just keep going in the chat box for, for the rest of the day and ruin the entire day's program. So, yeah, do interrupt. Well, the wonderful thing is now we're going to come back together across the online and the on-campus group so that we can share the ideas that we've been talking about because we've had great discussion online and great discussion here. And you know how I said I love mess? Well, the Miro board is looking beautiful. I can see there's lots of ideas and beautiful sticky notes on there. And anyone who chose the analog version that I printed out in the room, if you write down your thoughts, I will add them to the Miro board later. So we can have that as something that is an artifact of this session. So Simon, I might throw back to you now so that we can focus the lens on how this framework and the values, knowledges and activities it describes can help us in amplifying those quiet voices or help us in our practice in listening to those quieter voices. Thank you, Ali. Yes, um, I'm currently working on a, on a resource to accompany this framework where we'll think about um, uh, different aspects of a student engagement job. So there might be ones that are very academically focused or on surveys, or um, it might be about supporting skills among students, or it might be um, about rep systems. And therefore, some indicators will be perhaps more important than others or might jump out more than others. And so what I'd like to do for a further reflection as we come to the, the end of our hour is which indicators in that framework do you think most relate to the practice of engaging quiet or quietened voices. So if you're thinking about um, your, the, the kind of the equality and diversity and inclusion and liberation aspects of your roles, what are the, the indicators within the, um, the framework that you think would be most valuable for someone to have whose job is to um, build up those quiet voices? And so far away in the chat box, um, I don't know if you have a, a roving mic, Ali, if there's any suggestions in, 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 in the room there in Springfield um, anyone, th that people would like to suggest. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, anyone in the room want to point out one of those um, VKs or A's that they think um, points to that that theme and that that mission we have of trying to amplify the quiet voices? Okay, over here in the room. I've got a mic here for. Oh, thanks. 
Hello. Um, I'm actually going to go to the last one on the list, A8, acquiring, sharing and applying knowledge about student engagement policy and practice. I think that if we can do that successfully, students will know that there is a safe space for them to have a voice in what we do. So those students who are a bit quieter or not as used to coming forward um, will know that there is a space there available for them at the university to give their feedback and their opinion and collaborate with us. Yes, that, that's very important. I think um, when, when you're engaging people who sometimes don't always find it easy to engage or the structures don't allow them to be engaged, um, knowledge is so important. Knowledge of how best to engage people, knowledge of 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 kind of the dynamics that might be at play but also i suppose there's the knowledge that those so-called quiet voices might have themselves um and actually you know it's the stories that people tell the experiences that they have the the lives that they live um are sources of expertise and sources of knowledge um so i find yeah find, find, find that um, a, a very powerful idea um, one of my favourite kind of articles that I've I've read was in 2005, and it was by an, an American called Tara Tara Yosso Y O S S O, and it was about the cultural capital that minoritized groups have, and she was making the point that yes minoritized groups are kind of oppressed and must be liberated and must be helped, but actually they ha they inherently have um, skills and experiences and talents that other people don't have. Um, so, you know, f f in the example of Hispanic populations in the USA, they're much more likely to have strong familial links, they're much more likely to be bilingual, they're much more likely to understand systems of oppression compared to people who aren't. So, yeah, the, the pe people bring knowledge to this. So, yeah, that might be an example of A8 in terms of how you pick up on the knowledge that people have about their experiences and how you can use that to shape student engagement policy. So. Thank you. That's yeah, it. any other thoughts? Does, does someone online want to unmute and um, and share maybe one of the, the values that they think aligns with this work? Or someone in the room? No worries. It's Okay, over here, I've got someone. We'll just wait for the microphone. Um, hi, uh, Martin here from ACU. Um, I'm just looking at A6, um, just as an interesting point. And I think um, I recently heard the phrase feeling like a data pinata. Um, so the fatigue that comes with being constantly harried for uh, for details, information and feedback, but also the frustration that comes from not seeing any change off the back of that and it feeling like work without, uh, without necessarily feeling like there's payoff. So I think the idea of enabling the generation of data is one thing, but the use of that data. And I think thinking about ac accountabilities and, and, and indicators, you know, what are we doing to kind of track the use of that data meaningfully to kind of evidence that we are we are doing so meaningfully um, so we can help students feel like that their input through those data channels is having an impact and, and they have a role in assessing that and having a voice around how that's used. Um, also being mindful of the thresholds of, again, patience and fatigue around what we ask for. You know, no, no, no request for data without a pr proper purpose. I think is something that that um, we could think carefully about too. I agree more, Martin. I think I think there's a case for doing a life cycle of of the year in terms of feedback and data gathering points uh, and getting students, particularly, you know, if you can gra grab the quiet voices and saying, well, actually, are we asking the right questions? at the right time in the right way. You know, have we got too many surveys clustered at that point of the year so that, so that that ought to be rationalized? Or are we asking in the wrong way? Is it all, is it, you know, maybe people are fed up of, of filling out surveys, but they'd be very happy to chat over a coffee with someone, or they'd be very happy to kind of send a text or scribble something on a graffiti wall. So actually, can you get quiet voices to help you find um, the, the, the best way of giving voices? Um, Fabulous book chapter by some um, uh, Cassie Lowell um, came out earlier this year, um, and it's about, um, sorry, my mind's gone blank, the hard to reach university. 
So it, it's good coming back to this idea of the hard to reach student. And actually the hard to reach student is, is, is a bizarre concept because the student is only hard to reach because you're standing in the wrong place trying to reach them. And actually it's the university that is hard to reach for the student. So actually, if, how, how could we rethink, critically rethink the way that we're engaging students? How can we get the university or the college to be in a different position to engage that person? So that might mean deconstructing our regular ways of gathering feedback and gathering data. So um, yeah, so I, I, I think um, perhaps in A6, there's a bit of critical thinking that's required about exactly, you know, is the data we're gathering the right kind of data for the people that we're concerned about? Fantastic, um, thanks. Great question and thanks, Simon. Very thoughtful answer. I've got another question over here. Can I just give my microphone over? I'm going to give my microphone over. Here you go. Thanks, Kat. I'm Kat. I'm from UniSC. I, I wanted to pick up on uh, a kind of, I guess, a similar theme there uh, in V4 around student associations. And I guess that, uh, I don't know if Lucy's still here, but there's so many things that she said this morning that are just marinating in my brain that I want to go and spend a lot more time thinking about. Uh, one of the things that she talked about was uh, the meritocracy of the value that we place on things. And one thing that I had thought of was, um, particularly post-COVID, who decides what student engagement looks like? Um, and in terms of associations, that would probably at my university look like having students in that physical space on campus uh, and that they would that would be viewed as them engaging in that activity. Um, but who gets to decide what engagement looks like? So can we think about other frameworks um, like say universal design, for instance, that um, I guess sounds as though it's a one size fits all, but to me, I really see that as um, it's something where people can engage in different ways in activities where they feel comfortable or it meets their need and it still gives them a voice. So perhaps there's um, other frameworks that we can think about um, in terms of associations that enable us to raise up those quiet voices and the um, diverse student populations uh, that want to participate in student voice work. Thank you. Yeah, very, very powerful stuff there. And what I just want to share on screen, because it partly answers your question, but it also helps me kind of um, be conscious of, of, of the time that we have. These are just my suggestions on the screen here. Um, I'm not quite sure if that's on the screen yet in the room. I can, I can see yet. myself on screen. Um, but those of you, I think, um, possibly in the chat, in, in, in Zoom, will be able to see that I've got V3, K1 and A1 as my suggestions. And they are only suggestions of what might be the most relevant indicators. So V3, K1 and A1. So V3 is about... Um, Simon, uh, do you mind just sharing your screen again? Because I know you've got oh, a slide on that. Oh, am I, am I not? I am sharing. Oh, goodness, am I not? Right. Sorry, I thought I was sharing. No, right. you're right. Okay. Oh, it maybe stopped me sharing. Beautiful. Right. So there you go. Um, so yeah, V3 is about recognising the centrality of quality, diversity, liberation and inclusion. Um, K1 is about the implications of the diversity and intersectionality of the student population. So we've got the, and what's important here is the three things, the, the demography, so who we all are demographically, and the pedagogy, so we're all studying different things in different ways and at different levels, and then the geography, so, you know, you, you, Australians in the room certainly will know an awful lot about the the challenges of multi-campus um, delivery and remote and rural delivery. And that's something that we have some case, uh, some good practice on in Scotland. And that brings in a whole bunch of dimensions. And then A1, empowering all students to own and shape their learning. But many of you in your contributions just now have suggested some others. And actually, it probably depends on your role. So what you what I would suggest you do is really interrogate this framework um, uh, because you'll be coming at it from very different types of, of, of professional practice and say, well, actually, if I am to listen to quiet voices, here are the values, knowledge or activities. You know, it's this set of indicators that I probably need to think about more. Um, and if, especially if you're developing strategies and you're wanting to build capacities in others, create new roles or train people better to deal with with with. Um, uh, the engagement of quiet voices. Are there training programs that you could build around some of these categories, um, indicators rather, to help other people? Wow. Can you still hear us? Yes. Oh, fantastic. 
we just uh n- nothing to worry about nothing to worry about here we we just we just can't see you anymore but um but i i was going to say we've got five whole minutes left um in this session so simon what do you think would be the best thing for us to do next we could continue um maybe raising our voices and and talking about what we've shared so far I'd really love it if someone who was online wanted to to share because I heard there was an amazing conversation going on on there. Is there any chance anyone wants to unmute? Can I assure you we can't actually see your face right now? We'd only be able to hear your voice. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll be able to pick up on some of the, the concluding slides, but obviously you'll be able to pick up the slides later on, but I can see you're playing around with the projector soon. But yeah, there's some good chat in the chat box. Um, uh, Melissa's made a very good point. Sorry to pick on you, Melissa, just recently about A1 has been the most important because it's about, um, uh, you know, that that kind of the very nature of education. And um, Melissa says she's eager to ensure uh, that she's assisting students to define success on their terms and academic success looks very different for everyone. That's a really powerful point. And I'd never thought about that as an interpretation of A1. So thank you. else want to fire away i'm scanning back through the chat i think there, there was quite a lot of chat and i'm I, I think i could have missed some points um but um i do have another I, comment from in the room if if that's um, yeah, yeah, yes okay. just very very quickly to say that a couple of folk had talked about um the recognition the accreditation and recognition actually what do we give back to how do we professionally give back to people as well but yeah what, what have you got in the room Jamie? Oh, thank you, Shani from USQ, from the careers team. I just wanted to, when I glance across um, the, the the VK and the A, I'm seeing a lot of different pedagogies like transition theory and learning and teaching approaches. I'm, you know, seeing some scope for career theory. And I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more to some of the um, underlying um, ideas and theories and frameworks that helped you develop um, this framework here. Oh, goodness. Um, I'm going to have to be honest and say that there wasn't a massively theoretical basis to this. So the fact that you're spotting that is fascinating. And I would genuinely love it if you could drop me an email and explain a little bit more about what you're spotting here. Because I think if we could capture that, it will make us look even more intelligent than we are, because we can we can claim a theoretical grounding that we didn't actually invent. Um, so um, thank you. I think that's fascinating. I mean, be, it, rather than coming from theory, it came very much from um, from practice. You know, it's basically this, this this bunch of twenty or so student engagement practitioners who we get together three or four times a term just to kind of learn and share together, and and they just kind of put their heads together to talk about what defined their what defined their job. Um, but Ali alluded to the UK professional standards framework that, that, that comes from advanced HE that, that, that the HEA fellowships come out of something but we also did a scan um, again this isn't very theoretical but we did a scan of other similar models and there's a further education lecturers professional standards in Scotland and there's also just recently been created a um, a, a professional standards framework for people in widening access and participation roles. So there's just been a, a national network created in Scotland called SCAP, S-C-A-P-P, SCAP, um, the Scotland's Community of Access and Participation Practitioners. So they're like Sparks, but for widening access. And they came up with a similar framework. And then there's also a um, um, a framework f- uh, relating to um, quality students unions. So it was quite, it was, it was a scan of literature in that sense. But um, yeah, we haven't really looked at kind of theoretical frameworks that lie behind this. So yeah, I'd, I'd be I'd be fascinated to chat outside this meeting about what you're, what you're spotting in this, because that's not something that we've thought about. Thanks, Simon. And thanks for that question, Shaney. Um, we might just have one last question, if there's time. I'm going to walk towards someone. And if someone online talks in the meantime. Oh, we just free. to see, um, I'm, I'm grateful to, 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 to Mal in the, in the chat for just talking about uh, uh, more about the theories guiding the student engagement framework. I mean, I suppose just the fact that voices are important is a theory. The, the fact that, you know, 
we live in a democratic society and we, we engage students in our learning in the in the same way that we engage healthcare patients in the shaping of their services and citizens in, 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 in the shaping of their local, you know, provision and the world around them and tenants in, 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 in how housing is shaped, or at least we should be doing. So I think there's probably some kind of theoretical basis that just comes from living in a democracy. And, you know, maybe this relates to tomorrow's tomorrow's vote in, in, in Australia. But, you know, when you live in a democracy, it's important to recognize people's voices and include them in decisions that are made around them. So I suppose that's one of the driving principles behind student engagement. It's just what you do in a society where people have views on things. Um, that's not a theoretical framework. So I'm not answering the question. <laughs> it's the, the best I can do. <laughs> but but I think the spirit of what you're talking about there, Simon, resonates very strongly with those of us who are um, in Australia and I couldn't think of a better way to conclude our session so I would like to thank everybody today in the room online in the chat on the Miro board on my analog version of the Miro board in the room and I would like to thank you all for your thoughts and your energies here today it's just so wonderful to hear about all the work that is ongoing and all the deep thinking that we're doing um, so I would like to thank, ask everybody to thank Simon um, in the room and online with a round of applause.